I am Cyril Stober. The coronavirus pandemic continues ravaging the world, even in the face of concerted efforts by a unified globe to stop it. My guest today is a physician with more than three decades of experience in clinical medicine, public health, virology, and the development of vaccines and biological products. He held numerous positions in the public service, director of public health at the Federal Ministry of Health, he headed the Federal Vaccine Production Laboratory in Yava for so many years. He was chairman of the Presidential Task Force for Polio Eradication and Routine Immigration in 2008. He co-developed Hepatitis B vaccine and anti-snake venom against the Carpet Viper and two other poisonous snakes. He was among 16 people who established the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria in 2002. Now he's done so many things in medicine, but let's welcome Professor Abdul Salami Nasidi. Prof, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Well, just to mention that uh, Professor Nasidi has more than 50 scientific publications to his credit, and he served on several World Health Organization committees. He holds the national honor of Officer of the Order of the Niger, OON. And let's say currently he is um, the Provost of the College of Health Sciences, University of Africa in Bayasa State. Thank you once more, Prof. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, these are strange times, not just for the country, but the entire world. And seeing us appearing on a program like this, all dressed like this, with face masks, tells you the seriousness of what the world is going through today. This is what is called some bit of protection from this ravaging pandemic. And that's what we'll be talking about with uh, Professor Nasidi. But first, let's put this into context. The world is unified and it's engaging in a race to find a way of stopping this pandemic. You think it's any time soon in coming? Yes, for in the recent history, I can assure you that uh, there is nothing that has brought the world together, you know, uh, to fight uh, like this disease, this invisible enemy. And uh, now the unification is across board. It unified the systems, the capitalist and communist system. It unified, you know, the south and the north country, uh, countries. Uh, the strong and the weak, weakest countries. Uh, it, it unified uh, people of all religion and so on and so forth. And uh, the response came completely without any stinge of uh, uh, difference or discrimination. All races, all nations rose to face this challenge. And uh, as you rightly ask, uh, do, is there any hope in the nearest future? Uh, because of this unified approach and coordinated response by the WHO uh, in Geneva, definitely within the short, sh shortest period of time, we might end up with uh, effective vaccine. We might end up with uh, a, a therapy that can either, you know, uh, uh, slow down the uh, cause of the disease or, uh, you know, uh, limit number of deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course. If these two tools are found, you know, as at of today, uh, no vaccines, no drugs. So this makes this what makes it even more risky. That's why people are afraid. But we are very hopeful that in the nearest future, these.
tools will be developed and will be deployed. Well, since this pandemic broke, a lot has been learned about COVID-19, mm -hmm. but then there's still so much that is unknown about the mode of transmission, except for the fact that it's easily transmitted. But um, as of now, there's no concrete evidence on other forms of transmission. For instance, it's still said that contrary to the initial belief that uh, it's only the droplets that cannot travel long distances, there could still be some of the virus hanging in the air. Yes, uh, it's, uh, the virus, apart from being uh, very uh, deleterious, very uh, infectious and contagious, is a uh, mysterious virus because uh, the way it appeared, uh, the world is still yet to actually identify the real reservoir because it jumped from an animal to humans. And uh, we are uh, uh, trying to identify which of the animals are the actual reservoirs. So that has not been clearly, clearly you know, uh, clarified, even though there are so many speculations that it could be snakes, it could be bats, and so on and so forth. Unlike the other, you know, coronaviruses, the SARS virus uh, was actually uh, a virus that jumped from cybets, you know, into humans. Uh, well, and uh, the MERS uh, virus, the coronavirus, jumped from camels to humans. But this one, the speculation is maybe it jumped from snake to bat, uh, bat to snake, and then to human. So that is yet to be fully established. Then the next uh, issue is, it is a very huge virus. It's bigger than most of the other viruses, about, maybe about uh, 10 to you know, 20 times the uh, other viruses we know, like Lassa virus and others. So uh, it is being easily transmissible if it comes in contact either with a surface or as it comes as a droplet, and now they are saying, you know, it's, it also lasts in the, and hangs in the air. So, which means this virus, you know, is highly contagious like the Ebola virus. So if you touch the patient or any surface the patient has touched, you will catch it. If you go near the, the, the person who has the virus within the distance of less than one meter, it's possible you will catch it. That's why we're emphasizing social distancing. Now, if the person who has it was in this room and he leaves, and maybe he was sneezing before he leaves, the virus can be in the air for some time, and then you can come in four, five, six hours later, you might catch it. So uh, it is highly contagious and highly infectious. So it is really a virus that we have to face and fight seriously. Which brings us to this question that so many people have asked. There have been tremendous advances in technology. But the people are asking, is it that there has been a backstepping of medical research? Because by the nature of this disease, virtually nothing is known about um, how it manifests. And you say it must have jumped from one animal to other. But if the world had had the experience of the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, they had had the experience of SARS, then it follows that there might be some thinking that viruses are capable of mutating. Viruses like the coronavirus are capable of mutating. Would it be that medical science did not imagine that a coronavirus could mutate and become this novel coronavirus that we're dealing with now? Well, as you said, as you mentioned, the uh, SARS uh, coronavirus, which is now termed as SARS-CoV-1, uh, uh, belongs to that group of the coronaviruses that actually is smaller in size, but is also have, having the same type of gene as the other coronaviruses are having. The MERS uh, coronavirus is similar and uh, is also you know having properties similar to the SARS coronavirus. This novel coronavirus have the same gene, similar gene, not the same uh, composition like the other coronaviruses but is behaving very abnormally 
And this is why when they now detected it to be a coronavirus and, uh, you know, belonging to the same group, but having different properties, bigger in size and having double coat. So they said, oh, this is a new one, a new type. Now, being a new type, the behavior of the virus in animals and in human cells completely is a bit different from the other ones. It enters the human body or human cells and replicates, that means multiplies very, very fast. And the moment it is multiplying like that, it has the tendency to kill the cells. So if it kills the cells, it will now, you know, f uh, virtually transform any organ it is in. So uh, the most important is that the issue of mutation, they are, they are now finding that at particular different uh, levels and due to some factors, the virus is mutating. So we don't know whether at the end of the day, the virus could mutate to become weaker or it could mutate to become stronger. So with this type of pr uh, pr uh, property it has, or being very uh, vicious and uh, killing cells in humans, causing disease and death, so, and the speed with which it is mutating, uh, is now making the human, to, I mean, our uh, decision to be uh, frightened. It's not that the science, uh, you know, and the technology in the world is getting weaker, it's getting stronger and stronger. But what we are seeing in the virology world is as if these viruses are also learning, doing their own science. They come with new t uh, tricks that virtually, you know, defeat our, our previous knowledge. So it's as if we're starting all over to understand the property of this new virus. Would it be scary to think that even after coronavirus, there is a possibility that another virus, maybe another coronavirus, would exhibit even stronger and deadlier properties? In fact, uh, that is uh, what uh, I can assure you that what will happen. Mm -hmm. Because not long ago we thought Ebola was the only deadliest clear killer we are going to get that will frighten us and devastate uh, uh, the humanity. And uh, not long ago we had what they called the Spanish flu, you know, uh, which occurred in is it 1870 or something, ETC and so on and so forth. We had other plagues that uh, devastated the world. It's like every century comes with a new virus. Yeah, if you listen to what uh, Bill Gates uh, talked about, the, the, the virus of the century, he predicted that we could have this type of a virus and even had a picture of coronavirus. So in as much as human life is on the rolling in evolution, you know, and uh, we are moving, we are moving side by side, we are cohabitating the globe with animals and other you know, uh, subunits of life that we are either in, we are in symbiosis with them, which means we are living and exchanging benefits, or we are actually uh, in a stage of parasitism. So they either rely on you to feed on you or to multiply. The viruses are what we call absolute parasites. Mm. They can't live outside the human or the cell of an animal or human. So even if they are in droplet here, they won't last for a long time, they will die off if they don't have a chance to penetrate into a cell and multiply. They multiply only when they enter either animal cells or human cells. So with this happening, and the fact that we have so many changes occurring now in the world, you have the, um, uh, the uh, climate changes, uh, you know, this uh, world overheating and so on and so forth, in increasing radiations, increasing in pollution. All these are factors that make these pathogens to mutate. Mm. You know, they affect us physically and also affect them. So the property of the virus today, if it goes into different areas, maybe hotter area, it might mutate a little bit, and it goes where there's more radiation, it will mutate, they adapt. And in the process of adaptation, they can become more pathogenic, more of uh, harmful to human. Okay. Well, let, let, let's come now to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We have had challenges with a um, number of uh, issues among the viruses, for instance. When we had the problem with HIV AIDS, tuberculosis has done its ravaging. We still face challenges with Lassa fever, 
and now with this new one that um, the world doesn't seem to understand mm -hmm. what are Nigeria's chances of keeping its people safe well uh, you're absolutely right uh, Nigeria has been facing several uh, outbreaks you know uh, challenges in the last three to four decades uh, in some areas we did very well in some areas we are yet to perform and really uh, you know show the world that we are serious uh, yeah you know the most important one that we are battling with uh, now uh, is the uh, you know HIV AIDS uh, epidemic even though we have con you know managed to uh, you know to control is you know, uh, prevalence and to uh, spread more and more uh, through our awareness campaigns, through drug therapy and isolation, not, and, uh, not isolation but treatment. Uh, we have managed to understand the HIV epidemic and we are controlling it. Not long ago we did what they call the National uh, you know, AIDS uh, Surveillance uh, Listen, that NAIS, and that showed that we managed to reduce the volume of Nigerians living with HIV AIDS from about 3.8 million to about 1.3 or 1.4 million. That's a huge achievement. So we are working and succeeding on that. The next was polio. And the polio, uh, even though we didn't want to be the last country, but we have succeeded. We are just waiting by June or July to have certificate that Nigeria is polio free. So that's a great achievement. You know, we are succeeding. And the next one is TB. You know, we're the third in the world with epidemic of TB. It's not very uh, good at the way it is going, but we have managed to start actually uh, getting the right way of controlling that outbreak. Then, of course, the Lassa fever. Lassa fever started coming bit by bit, slow, uh, slowly, and uh, we thought, you know, it is a disease that was actually identified in Nigeria. Lassa is a village in Nigeria and Borno State, and uh, we could do a lot to contain it. But to our surprise, it went to be start becoming endemic, appearing in areas we didn't know it before, and actually becoming more and more uh, potent and killing people, even killing healthcare workers. So that is now increasing in frequency. We have to really double our efforts to be able to control it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're having a reverse in some places of measles outbreak, where we had controlled measles and also they were still having one or two outbreaks here and there, you know a lot about uh, meningitis. So, in our attempt to fight these outbreaks, we've been putting mechanisms in place. And uh, these uh, mechanisms, these systems, are now helping us to be, to be ready to fight other uh, diseases. For instance, uh, what we used to fight Ebola when it came, and the fact that there are some investment a little bit, so they increase the capabilities of, of our labs, capabilities of our health institutions and surveillance system, we were ready a little bit from that diagnostic point of view to, to face you know, uh, this uh, coronavirus outbreak. But from the clinical point of view, treatment point of view, isolation set point of view, we were not ready. Hmm. Well, in the face of all this, what do you say to people who still say the whole thing about uh, COVID-19 is a hoax? And, um, you know, there are so many conspiracy theories flying around. Some say it's just an economic warfare. Others say, no, it has to do more with radiation. And that uh, some even attempting to explain the virus says, look, the virus is not living. Mm -hmm. And so many people are confused. But there are so many people who still think it's a hoax. What do you say to them? Well, uh, the, so the many of people that you are talking about ranged from very highly placed people, heads of state and all this, thing, and to the lowest people in the community who, who think that it's not true. They call it it's a hoax, forget about it. But a hoax that is entrenched and is catching country by country, is catching people of different ages, of different uh, so, uh, societal uh, level and so on and so forth, and then killing. You know, you've seen not long ago, we had that this something uh, called Corona, whatever, is killing Chinese. And people thought, oh, this is China problem. It's very far from us. Before we know why we are, it has crossed out from China to other Asian countries. 
Before you say Jack Robinson, as they say in Nigeria, it is in Europe. And then for a long time, there are no cases in Africa. And uh, many Africans, even some African history, say just say, oh, maybe this is the normal flu, the type of European and uh, disease of the far, far uh, nations. And just like this in one case appeared in Egypt, within two weeks, other cases in Algeria. And before you know where you are, Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, the whole of continent is now virtually you know, in, in, inflicted by this virus. So anybody who thinks this is a hoax is thinking or uh, behaving that way at his own peril. It's a danger that has come close. It's a danger that is already here. Now our fear is that don't allow yourself to be taken by surprise by that virus. If you, if you slacken and you joke and you behave as if it's a white man's disease, as they say, it's a far disease and this, you'll be shocked. I'll give you a story. HIV AIDS, when it entered Nigeria, many Nigerians said it is, not, it is American invention to uh, devastate uh, whatever, the world or something. So, within uh, maybe about three months, when we got the first few cases, we had from one, two, three, we had about 21, just like we're having now. And people start saying, oh, it's, it won't go anywhere because it cannot penetrate black man's skin. <laughs> yeah, but our skin is too thick, our this and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, even the, somebody sang a story, a song. The, that person ended up dying of AIDS. Then at the end of the day, we, ha we ended up with about 3.8 million Nigerians having AIDS. And then the so-called uh, white people and the other races had less cases. And they knew what to do to come. So we should not allow ourselves to be deceived by the fact that this disease arrived from China. It could end up devastating the African continent more than we're thinking. In fact, the DG of WHO came out, who is also an African, he's Ethiopian, he came out. He said, oh, listen, I'm becoming afraid. Africa might be the last theater. And uh, he said, the worst is yet to come for the African continent. And as you can be seen, the outbreak is moving slower and slower, but becoming more and more consolidated. All African countries, all that have the case, are now having increase in weekly reports, weekly incidents of the, of the disease. Well, we will never tire of talking about the best way to stay safe from COVID-19. Even as people still doubt, what are the best measures for those who still have not had anything to do with it? What are the best measures to stay safe from it? And then we'll now go into for those who have tested positive, and then we'll talk about for those who have recovered, and what are the measures? Well, as you rightly said from the opening uh, statements you made, uh, it's a very interesting uh, disease that has come and they're surprising everybody. So w the most important in any war is for you to be able to know your enemy and know the property of your enemy, the strength of your enemy. So even though this disease is mysterious and very dangerous, the humans and our science were so strong and fast that within a short period of time, the Chinese scientists identified the virus, characterized the gene, and sent the information about the gene to, to, to the world through the bleach. So we now know the virus. We know the enemy. That's why we can quickly diagnose and know that who is carrying it, who is not carrying it. If we didn't do, have this method before, it would have been so dangerous for us to handle this outbreak. It would have been impossible. So the modern technology, biotechnology, has helped us to, to, uh, to, to, to have this information, to know what to do. So now that we know that the disease can come to your country, it will be diagnosed, they will tell you, yes, the virus is in your body, and uh, or somebody's body, keep away from him, do isolation, then we know what to do. Now, different countries are using different methods to fight the disease. When it came to China, they used all known public health methods to fight it. They didn't work until they introduced new ones. And so the new ones is what we're experiencing today, the lockdown. They say, oh, listen, you know, this disease is still 
transmitting how you know we we do all we are uh, supposed to do but people come together and the level of contact and whatever is increasing so the disease is progressing in geometric pro uh, progression so what, what do we do they realize that if you put people apart you know so the transmission you know between human to human is, re is reduced it's not sustained so they now introduce this you know uh, social distancing it started working it didn't work fully now they now realize that if you do that and you don't decontaminate surfaces it will not be as effective as possible so they introduce the social distancing and introduce city not just the contamination of everything in the city if i'm sure you saw them spraying everywhere mm. then the volume of transmission reduce uh, you know substantially now they now said ah maybe we should now do do even lockdown keep everybody at home for two weeks because incubation period is two weeks so even those who have it if they remain at home for two weeks it is either they are well or they are sick if they are sick they will call the healthcare people to go and pick them so within that two weeks you do all these three the lockdown social distancing and and the testing you know you will now be able to reduce the circulation of the virus and you get it out of your country but the last one in uh, the fight against the disease what should people do is this you know health education this health promotion that you are doing like what we are doing now is for people to listen and all the uh, advice given by the WHO and the, the NCDC to listen carefully and follow if you make mistake you are causing you are trying to uh, cause death for yourself so I was very pleased I'm happy to see what you did when we came here you said they should clean the surface because some people were here, which is right, you decontaminated uh, your, your hands, you know, with hand sanitizer, even the pen you are holding. That means you are doing from your own side everything possible to keep yourself away from the virus. Those who say, ah, it's not true, it's this and they are, they are really taking big risk. Mm. So a lot depends on you. Well, Prof, uh, testing is a key aspect which you mentioned. And sometimes you hear analysts say, Perhaps what's responsible for the relatively low cases in Africa is that not much testing is going on and that if they were to test more, we probably would see more cases. So the low figures may not truly reflect the low uh, occurrence of the disease in Africa, but as a result of uh, not testing. Others think otherwise. How do you view this? You are right. You know, there's a country in Africa that virtually up to now no case. So jokingly they met the Minister for Health and they asked him, oh wonderful, your country has no cases. Yeah, how come? He said, we don't have test system. <laughs> we are not testing. So if you don't test, you don't, you don't see, even though it is there. Okay? It's like walking on the, the path in the, in, the, in the village without a torchlight. You can walk and match a cobra, you will not know, except you see it. So you are absolutely right. Countries that picked it early in Africa were countries that have the capability, the capacity to test viruses of that nature. The first one was Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, and South Africa. So these are the countries that really have sophisticated laboratories to test. So it, it is right. We, the, then when we now started testing, the number of cases, I'm now just zeroing on Nigeria, was low. One, two, three, four, then I keep saying it will grow, it will grow. Now, I said, the more we test, the more we shall see. So they had no reagents, enough reagents to test a lot of people. But when we now start having more reagents, so the, for the, the DG NCDC said we've tested about 2,000 samples. And out of 2,000 samples, we have 174 uh, positive. Some of them are all patients. That's very high. So now it means, you know, if that is the case, we can do uh, uh, what we call, uh, I mean, forecasting or uh, this and that, that the number of people that actually will be carrying the virus in the community, in the society, can be multiplied by 10. Some of them are carrying the virus without knowing that they are not sick. I'll give you an example. In uh, some countries that they followed, did good epidemiological survey of this disease where they had several cases, especially China, they found out that 
almost 70 percent of those who acquire the virus i mean who who fall sick from the virus are, are, are male majority of the female who catch the, the virus don't fall sick almost 40 percent of the young ladies that have the virus don't even show any sign mm. at all so they are healthy they are not getting sick they will be in the community they will be transmitting not sexually i mean just in contact mm. and then they are not uh, this so uh, now the male that are having the disease you know if they uh, uh, let's say move into areas where you have others they can end up becoming sick within the short period of time and in the process of taking care of them those who come who don't know that they have it will acquire it more mm. so this uh, these roots of transmission keeps increasing now, the only way to be able to understand and limit that is the Korean way, South Korea. So what South Korea did, they didn't do lockdown. South Korea is not doing lockdown. South Korea is doing mass screening. You know, so, you know, they do what they call drive-through screening. You know, to the extent that each, each test costs $10. It was cheaper for the government to screen as many people in hot areas as possible without thinking about the money to then to wait until people are sick mm. now they they introduce that uh, drive through screening and they will be screened you are in the car you drive you just come they just take your temperature take the test take your details you go if they find that you are positive before you say jack robinson they have gone there they've taken you they've isolated you so they introduce the i mean the strategy of test isolate testing and isolation that is a way also all right Prof, there's, there's a worrisome aspect especially in nigeria now there are some people who are still scared so scared about this disease that when people now fall ill the first thought is that probably it is covid19 and so some are not willing to step out because they fear isolation people have been made to think well once you have COVID-19, they take you away, they lock you up, and uh, nothing happens to you. If you survive, good. If you don't, too bad. So there are actually some people who they feel certain conditions, feverish conditions, but they are not too, you know, they're not thinking about going to test for anything because they're scared. My advice to such people is that if you don't want to die from this type of disease. The moment you start having those type of symptoms that could mimic COVID-19, call the healthcare workers immediately. If you are in a place where you can't call them, you can get your relations to go take you to a health center and report. Because this is a disease that if they don't handle you early and it goes into the severe phase, the chance for you to survive is less than 10%. So the earlier you are identified and the earlier the start intervention, the greater the chance for you to survive. So my advice, nobody should hide. Like me, I started coughing about two weeks ago. I didn't understand the cough. It was like dry cough. I, I, I became so worried. I didn't wait. My temperature was low. I didn't have high temperature, but I said I must get myself tested. And then, you know, when I was telling my colleague, he started laughing, he said, look at you. I need the whole symptom before, you, before we test you. So if you are having three, two or three of the symptoms, fever, cough, and then you are starting to have some difficulty in breathing, and you, you are staying at home, you are saying that you are ready to go. But then there have also been cases of people who have come out of uh, COVID-19, survivors as they say and uh, they're out there so it does mean of course that there's still a chance of people to survive matter of fact they say the number of people who are recovering will exceed those who are dying as a result of covid19 so does this show something positive uh, of course you, you know actually the number of people that are dying from the COVID-19 uh, uh, patients is just about between 3 to 10 percent. In Italy, 
is about 10%. In China, it was about 3%. In Spain now, it's about 6%. So the chance of survival is much higher than those who are dying. But why is the world afraid? Why is America, China, Italy, uh, France, China, the countries with strong health systems, are allowing their people to die in this number, 5,000, 3,000, 10,000, and they couldn't do anything? You know why? Because if the disease enters that final stage, it's difficult to reverse it. It's difficult. Even the, with the respirators and all, you see them struggling with the respirators and all this, but if it, is past, it passes one stage, it's not easy to bring them back again. So, yes, many will survive and come out. Now, the next thing is, when you have survived and you are out, don't think that, oh, now you have, you have immunity, you might not catch it again. Some places they're saying there are cases of reinfection. We don't know yet. But some scientists have shown that there could be reinfection. Yeah, but, but now this, this, this brings up a, a, a new challenge. It is assumed, well, I don't know as the expert you tell us, it's assumed that um, vaccination is a form of providing immunity against certain viruses. Mm -hmm. You introduce so that the body develops a system to fight it. Yes. But going by that, you, you would ordinarily as a layman think, well, when someone has had COVID-19, it's possible that they come out of it, they have become immune. But again, studies are saying they may well be reinfected. Mm. What does that do to this concept of vaccination? Now that the world is in a race to provide a vaccine, would it really be effective? Yeah, you see, what, to get immunity from the disease, is one thing. To get immunity from vaccination is another thing. Mm. So at times, when you are sick and you get out of the disease, your body could have either fought the cause of the disease or the drugs you took could have killed the cause of the disease, the virus or the bacteria. So uh, I'll give you an example. Somebody has HIV AIDS. Okay, he has the virus and uh, he is sick and then he's treated with antiretrovirus and then he's out but he still has the virus a little bit and so on and so forth. The virus in his body but the virus is not uh, causing his body to produce neutralizing antibodies. So the antibodies that the body is producing is not the type that neutralizes the, the virus. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So as a result up to today, there's no effective vaccine against HIV AIDS. Experiment, experiment, experiment. So, uh, the uh, coronavirus is huge. It has big coat. I, I am sure, as a virologist, that when the vaccine comes, the vaccine will be very effective against it. But if you are waiting for the vaccine to come before you are decent, you'll be deceiving yourself because even some diseases with vaccines still do have you know, outbreaks coming like measles have the most effective vaccine against them. You still have outbreaks. Uh, then the, um, you know, yellow fever, one of the most effective vaccines and so on and so forth. So, in fact, based on what you are saying, some countries are strategizing. They say, okay, look, look let's not overdo this thing. Let's not overdo social distancing. Let's allow the virus to mingle into people. After all, only about 10% of those who come into contact with disease will come ill. They say through that way, we are doing natural immunization. So the number of people that will have the virus will be high, and then uh, we shall have what we call hard immunity. Hmm. Hard immunity, that is immunity enough to protect the community. So, and if you do that, British, Britain was about to do that before the disease started flying, you know, in, in, in London and other places. Uh, some of the scientists said, oh, don't worry, let's give the room to the virus to circulate among people, especially the youth that don't fall sick easily. And then within a short period of time, we shall build what we call herd immunity, and then the community is protected. Well, as efforts have been made to find a, a way of stopping this pandemic, you find that, um, as is usual all over the world, all kinds of so-called remedies and cures have been bandied around. Uh, and 
people swallow this hook, line and sinker? One of the biggest questions has been hydrochloroquine, or chloroquine as we know it. And to the extent that some people have gone ahead without any medical advice whatsoever and started uh, ingesting huge amounts of chloroquine. The world says this is still at testing stages. Please speak to Nigerians. Um, this is our constituency and uh, people have generally said, oh, it's okay. We know that we have chloroquine in this country and uh, it used to be one of the most really readily available drugs. So we are fortified and people have been carrying on. Yeah, uh, the story of hydroxychloroquine being effective against the disease was reported by some French scientists. Uh, they are thinking that hydroxychloroquine uh, is working to boost the immunity uh, to get the body to fight the, the virus. The mechanism is not fully established yet. But, you know, uh, if you come to Africa, especially Nigeria, I'm speaking to Nigerians now, uh, we've been using before chloroquine, or quinine, you know, uh, based products to fight malaria, to treat malaria. You know, so anybody who had malaria before, if you remember when we were young, they force you to take the most bitter drug of your life. Mm -hmm. And they have to take it now, they have modern drugs and so on. So this is either quinine or quinine derivatives. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what, so the, one of the major side effects of that quinine and the chloroquine was heart problem, heart attack, I mean, heart uh, reaction. So if uh, you take a little bit of overdose of chloroquine, you can destroy your heart. So it is so dangerous to take chloroquine uh, or quinine without prescription. So that's number one. Number two, you know, it has not been fully established yet to take chloroquine even before you come into contact with the coronavirus. I had a friend who told me, he said, ah, look, don't worry, I'm not worried about coronavirus anymore, your, your coronavirus. I said, it's not my coronavirus. I said, why? He said, oh, because I bought enough chloroquine. So anytime I have to travel or something, I will take like <laughs> two or three uh, uh, dishes with me. And even if the virus comes into my body, it will meet chloroquine there. <laughs> and the chloroquine will, will slow it down. It doesn't work like that. If you have, somebody has uh, the coronavirus uh, infection and maybe he has started developing symptoms and the uh, doctors believe that they could use the hydroxychloroquine you know, to mitigate the impact of that virus on his body, they will take into consideration many factors. His heart status, whether he's hypertensive or not, whether he has any comorbidity that could worsen after they give the chloroquine. So don't take chloroquine at all without medical prescription, doctor's prescription. Two, chloroquine does not prevent the effect of the virus on your body if you take it before the infection. Three, the chance that you will get other complications, liver, the kidney, and the heart is very high if you abuse chloroquine. Well, the internet is awash with so many other remedies. People have talked about salt and water, gargling with salt and water. You recall when uh, Ebola uh, first hit, and uh, the story went around about um, salt and all that. And part of it has resurfaced with coronavirus. There are people who have talked about um, lemon peels. People have talked about uh, certain concoctions and claim they all do. Some talked about onions and garlic. All these remedies are out there. All of this for people who are just laughing them off. What do you say? What's your comment about that? What I will say is that uh, we cannot ignore traditional medicine, alternative medicine. Mm. They play a key role in actually, you know, uh, ameliorating the uh, suffering and uh, the impact of the, the disease on your body. If you have the uh, the infection, if someone has the infection, and then you know you will have temperature, you will have headache, you will have abdominal pain, at times diarrhea. So the you know, traditional medicines that you are mentioning, and uh, this can help. They can help reduce the temperature, they can help reduce the headache, they can help, you know, improve the abdominal uh, uh, status and so on and so forth. So, uh, I can't say don't take, they are very useful. All, all the ones you mentioned are very useful. But they don't 
touch the virus. They don't stop the effect of the virus. Mm -hmm. So they might not save your life. They can reduce the suffering. You know, you, it may reduce your temperature, may reduce your headache, may reduce, but it might not. It can't stop the virus from multiplying and stop the virus from killing someone. Now, the question of uh, using alcohol-based hand sanitizers. The very mention of alcohol has also led quite a number of people to think: well, alcohol is just alcohol, and there have been reports of people who have gone out and used things like vodka, whiskey, brandy to either wash their hands or to drink huge quantities of it, believing that uh, once you consume that, it washes down the virus into the stomach and then the stomach juices do the rest and kills it. You see, uh, one thing that if you inhale the virus, it doesn't necessarily go through the stomach, uh, the esophagus that goes to your stomach only, it goes through the air pathway into the bronchial area. So you can't take hot water or take vodka that will go through your lungs, through your throat, you die. But let me just explain. Alcohol kills the virus from 60% and above. It comes into contact with the virus, it kills it. Ordinary soap, this uh, soap you use in washing your hands, because the virus is coated with a uh, fat coat, as soon as it comes into contact with soap, ordinary soap, it starts melting. It kills it, but at least 20 seconds, you can get rid of that virus. So uh, hypochlorite, this hypochlorite, this uh, GIC and others, you know, are very effective against the virus. They are most effective against all coated virus, Ebola, all this and so on and so forth. Yes, but you can't drink those. But then. you can't drink those. Okay. Now, drinking whiskey, uh, vodka, all this, vodka is 40%, not 60%. Even though you can do a gogoro of almost 90% that it can kill the virus and kill you if you keep drinking it. So you have to choose. So in the long run, the basics of personal hygiene are still apply here. Uh, we can't stop talking about it and uh, I mean we cannot emphasize it too much. So let's hear that from you again, Prof. Now, yes, I said if you take what, you need, what needs to be done to get us out of this uh, you know, unfortunate pandemic, uh, that a lot, almost 60% of, of it depends on individuals. Mm. Yeah, so, so one is uh, first and foremost, keep yourself away from the virus. Because if you know somebody who has just arrived from these infected countries, we are now becoming one. So you now keep away from them. Uh, if you already go to a place where you don't know, there are many people and also you don't know uh, what has happened, must have happened there, you come out, you wash your hands, as, as prescribed, if you um, <coughs> you know happen to be you know maybe by chance you took care of somebody who is ill and he has symptoms, then they confirm that he is uh, positive. Then you know how to start behaving, how to really keep yourself you know uh, uh, away from the virus. And then you know uh, in a what point did you raise again? The last point. Yeah, the one about just personal hygiene. And yeah. So maintaining personal hygiene is so important that is almost 45 percent of everything then maintaining environmental hygiene is now become so crucial that's what i told you in china after they did the social distancing after they did the isolation and they realizing that it's not working they had to now come to combine environmental sanitation and decontamination so personal hygiene environmental hygiene very crucial in controlling the disease well uh, Professor Nasidi, I like to be an optimist and uh, look at post-COVID-19, uh, believing that um, the world will surmount this pandemic. But beyond it, two things I'd like to look at. What happens to the world, which will never be the same again, really, as so many people say. And two, the question of stigma. People have recovered and have been discharged. But then they have also asked, many of them have asked to remain anonymous because we're beginning to see stigma here when they say someone has had COVID-19, it becomes pariah. Uh, people stay away from them, from their families. Mm -hmm. What do you say as we round off? Ah, well, uh, first and foremost, what will become of the world after you know, uh, corona pandemic? One thing that has happened and shocked the world is that a tiny 
virus, invisible, can come and put and level us, put us in the same level. The most developed countries and then the so-called, sorry to use, shithole countries. You know, that we, the virus came, confused everybody. Those with atomic bomb, they don't know what to do with atomic bombs now and so on and so forth. They are confused. They are dealing with a small virus that is killing their people. They don't know how to handle it. So now people are asking, why do we need all these bombs, all these I mean, armaments and so on and so forth, when there are quiet, natural, hidden uh, biological enemies somewhere that can come and wipe all of us out. The, change, the thinking of all countries will, will, I mean, will change. Thinking of all countries will change. How they will now handle their defense issues, how they will handle their health issues. For instance, many countries in Africa don't even give up to 3% of their budget to health. Now, after this, no, after Ebola and then this one, I'm sure every country will sit up. In Abuja, in Abuja here there was, what do you call, uh, the uh, African Heads of State Summit on Ebola, on the AIDS. And there they, we decided, they decided that each country should uh, uh, allocate 15% of their budget to health sector. Only one country is doing that now. But after this, I can assure you, many countries will give even 20% just to make this in. Then um, the, the last point you raised, stigma. the stigma. Stigma, you know, was like moving, moving stigma not like HIV. Now, you say initially it started far away from us, that country started as, you, any, any person from that country you stigmatize. Now it went to Europe, they couldn't st stigmatize them this anymore, so it keeps changing. Now it comes to your own locality, it's happening, then you say, oh, it's people who came from abroad. In fact, somebody said it's disease of the rich. Any rich man who comes from the UK, or you or America or listen you run away from. So the stigma, you know, is not like the HIV AIDS stigma or all this and so on so forth, but a stigma that is on a different level of uh, uh, interpretation. Mm. So it's not and also nobody can laugh for too long. So like, this man has coronavirus. Yeah, this is, because the person who has the coronavirus that is sick will not last long outside. They either isolate him he either recovers or is gone. So don't like HIV is that people will be hanging for long. So stigmatization, in the, as far as this disease is concerned, is not as important as you know actually addressing the issue to get rid of the virus. Well, Professor Abdul Salami Nasidi, uh, a virologist, would like to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us on uh, coronavirus pandemic. And uh, we do hope uh, we'll keep you around for, you know, other times to update us on efforts that have been made either to find a vaccine. For now, there still is no vaccine. No drugs. No drugs. No so specific is, drugs, no, spe no vaccine. What you do is manage uh, the patients and treat symptoms. And then personal hygiene, environmental hygiene, social distancing. Once again, I'd like to thank you for coming on one-on-one, -on -one, Professor Abdul Salami Nasidi. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. And uh, that's our program today. Next week, we'll be back with one-on-one. -on -one. I am Cyril Stober, and I say stay safe.